Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, Jonathan Goldhill here, and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. And today's guest is Patty Plu. Patty is an ESOP evangelist and a gifted entrepreneur that has established several successful businesses throughout her 30 plus year career. She has extensive experience buying, selling, and running businesses. Now, adding to that experience is selling through an ESOP, which has provided her with the insight to help other business owners protect their legacy and sell with integrity. So let's welcome Patty Plu uh, with the Excel Legacy Group. Patty, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. So Patty, first of all, for our listeners, maybe some of them don't even know what an ESOP is. Um, we're talking about Employee Stock Ownership Program, correct? That's correct. And it, uh, it actually Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Plan. Okay. So we're going to get into the details of what they are, but let's start with a little bit of background about yourself. Tell us um, you're a serial entrepreneur. You've had been in family businesses, I think dating back to 1990. Um, tell us about your origin so people know um, where you're coming from in terms of history. Well, I have a nursing background. So my uh, first business and actually the one I transitioned into an ESOP were medical based. And uh, the one that I just transitioned to an ESOP did employer sponsored health care. So my background is actually nursing. And then I discovered uh, the world of entrepreneurship. And, and that was early on in my career in about 1990 or the early 90s. And I also uh, founded a event production company and speakers bureau which my daughter runs to this day. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was a couple medical companies that I had started and then transitioned into the employer-sponsored healthcare company. And then uh, the final transition was the latest uh, healthcare company that had 200 employees at the time of transition to an ESOP. And we almost sold the company to a third party buyer, putting all of our employees at risk of losing their job because it was a, um, a roll up and the company probably would have shut our offices down and moved our, you know, the corporate office to a different state that they were in. And it was actually during a uh, meeting with the financial advisor, my husband and I were meeting with, when he picked up on the fact we had been offered, let me back up. We had been offered 30% over fair market value for our company from a, a third party buyer. Mm. Now, how does any business owner turn that down? Right? right. Hard to walk away from that. It's hard to walk away. And that was the one business I had that wasn't a family owned business with a, a secession planning, you know, with generational secession planning. And so we were all on board, but all very concerned about our employees. So we're trying to put contracts in place for at least two years so they'd be protected. They helped us grow that business after all. 
And then when my husband and I were meeting with the financial advisor, he asked us, he said, you know, listening to you, I almost feel like you'd be better off uh, transitioning to an ESOP versus a uh, selling to a third party because you're so concerned about your employees. He said, do you know what that is? And we knew that it was a uh, employee owned company because we had clients that were ESOPs. But that's as far as the uh, learning curve went, not only for myself and my husband, for the additional four partners. None of us knew the benefits, the tremendous benefits of transitioning your company to an ESOP, including if you're a family business. So once we learned about that, um, and I took it back to my partners, they said, but an ESOP only guarantees fair market value, which is one of the benefits. You, they have to pay fair market value for the owner's shares. <clears throat> so my partner said, we're off, we're, you know, our offer is 30% over fair market value. And lo and behold, the very first meeting we had, the purchase price offer was reduced to fair market value and because they were not going to allow certain ad backs that were on our balance sheet. Little did I know is that there's an actual term for that. It's called deal creep. So I said to my partners, I said, we're already at fair market value. How much further south is this going? A and B, why don't we consider the ESOP option, at least look into it. I mean, it's got so many benefits and it's guaranteed fair market value. So that's what we did. We uh, went down the path of the ESOP for our own company. And that uh, the ESOP was finalized in 2020 for our, our company. Very interesting. Okay, so let's let's dive into this and, and break it down a little bit. So first of all, um, I don't know how much research you've done on this anecdotally or otherwise, but in the last podcast I did with someone, we were actually talking about how often do we think it's the case that owners are really concerned about contracts for their employees? What's your experience in this area? Are, are owners that are selling oftentimes very concerned about one employee, several employees? Do they put contracts in place? Are these deal killers? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think that they would have allowed the two-year contract or it never even got that far. But my, I have talked to a lot of business owners that wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to protect their employees. I don't know the exact percentage of business owners that want to do that, but I've talked to enough people, enough business owners myself personally, that I do know that they want their employees protected. And not just not just one, but some of them, you know, have a leadership team they want protected. Sure. But there's others that they want to leave a legacy. Yep. And, and it, are, are these difficult things to do in the sale of a business in your experience? Not at all. Um, I know that that's one of the misconceptions out there, that they're very complicated and overwhelming. And I will tell you the reason that they are is what I have discovered is there are not enough um, professionals out there that do ESOPs day in and day out to know all the rules, regs, and everything that it takes to put an ESOP together. So let's just say. But, but in the case of selling in, in an ordinary sale, not an ESOP, do you think it's easy to protect the employees? Do you think that you can put contracts in place that will that the the buyer will hold up to and that won't make the deal go go bad? I don't think you can protect your employees. No, in in a third party sale. Okay. I think there could be layoffs. I think, in in my opinion, the only way to really protect your employees is to sell your company to them. Gotcha. Okay. And you're protect then you're protecting them because once the company is sold and it doesn't belong to you anymore, yeah. you're not there anymore. I mean, it's their okay. company and they they can, you know, do whatever they want with it. And if okay. they want to bring in their own people, their own talent, they can do that. 
So we know families, family businesses are much more loyal to their employees than yes. ordinary businesses. And that's because they are family businesses and uh, they are challenged with transferring the business to the next generation. Um, and you have some opinions about this. You think it's changed from even a decade ago. So what what's different today than it was uh, 10 or more years ago? Well, first of all, with family businesses 10 years ago, um, that was the norm in a family business that the next generation would take over. What I have found today is there are so many um, children that have gone to college, developed their own careers, and they're not um, stepping up to take on the family business. Mm -hmm. And so that leaves the, the family in, there's some decisions to make. What do we do with these, this business if we don't have any family members that are willing to take over? Gotcha. And also, I would imagine not only are they interested in, in other things, but with the plethora of private equity funds that are out there and family offices and the increasing sophistication in those areas, they are looking at small businesses. And so there's an opportunity to sell to a third party company and just exit altogether. And that probably is right. pretty, pretty attractive. Um, I agree. I agree. It can, it, it can be pretty attractive, but I can guarantee you that it cannot stand up next to an ESOP, especially if you look at an ESOP over a 10 year period, there's nothing, there's not even a strategic sale third party. There's, Nothing else that can compare to the performance of an ESOP. And that's because of the tremendous benefits that a traditional sale does not offer. Okay, so let's break it down. Let's start with what is an ESOP? Sorry if my internet connection is unstable. An ESOP. Sorry. Yes. What is an ESOP, Patty? An ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan. And what that means is an ESOP is a retirement fund for your employees. So how it works is very similar to a 401k, but it's actually been, um, it's been stated that it's like a 401k on steroids. And you'll understand why once I go through the rest of the benefits. So first of all, it doesn't cost the employees anything. It's a free gift to your employees. So, because what happens is the company itself actually buys the shareholders out, utilizing a portion of bank financing and owner financing. And I'll get into that because they've said, you know, it's been said that one of the um, negatives about an ESOP is a bank will not loan up to fair market value will not loan 100 percent okay so the owner has to take some sort of owner financing well there is a tremendous benefit to doing that that to me i don't look at it as a negative that there's some portion of owner financing and i don't think once i tell you about this little a benefit that you will feel it's a negative either so well, let's talk about how much we're talking about, because a typical business, as I understand, especially a service business, may only get anywhere from a third to two thirds of the selling price as a down payment. And a service business might have to take carry back up, up to two thirds of the selling price. So how much are we talking about in, in an ESOP? A bank usually loans anywhere from two and a half to three and a half terms. So that's what you'll see with a, with a bank financing note. But on the other hand, so with an ESOP, which is not typical with a third party sale, okay, you're guaranteed fair market value for your shares. Okay. So your company is valuated and, and then we, go over a feasibility report with you that shows you what the valuation is, 
and over a 10 year period, how your company will perform as an ESOP. So during, during that, with, with that being said, it's all, we're also reviewing the owner financing and the, uh, the bank financing. So let's just use for easy math, 50, 50. Okay. You've got a 50% loan from the bank and you're carrying 50. Okay. On no matter, no matter if it's 50% you're carrying 25% you're carrying, whatever it is, if you do any type of owner financing, you will receive warrants in exchange for the owner financing. In addition to interest, at a premium rate, okay? What would be a premium rate? What kind of interest are we talking about in today's market? Um, five to 7%, maybe is, higher. Is it all depends on what's fixed? negotiated with the trustee. Okay, is that fixed or is that a variable rate? No, it's fixed. Okay. It's a fixed rate. Yep. Okay. So with the warrants, during the, the portion of the loan, Okay, you have these warrants. So with normal attrition in a company, any employees that term during that period, the shares come back to the original shareholders during that loan period, up to 49.9%. The government does not allow more than that as of 2004. They changed the ruling. What we see on average is about 30 to 40% of the shares come back to the original shareholder. Those shares can be resold back to the company or the value of the company at the time. And there's two buckets, it's called the second bite of the apple. One bucket is for the shareholders. The second bucket is called the management incentive program and this is for your key leadership, okay? So if you have leaders or in the family business situation, if you have family members, those family members can be part of the management incentive program. And I'm going to give you an example of a company that's local uh, to me here in Wisconsin. They were sold as a, through an ESOP, $25 million. Okay. They purchased four other portfolio companies during that second bite of the apple period. And now they were now they're worth $100 million. Okay. So when they went, so the owners, there were there was 30% in the bucket total. The owners took 20% of that and they put 10% in the management bucket, the management incentive program which had five uh, leaders in that bucket. Let's just say five family members, okay? Okay. So it's worth a hundred million. The owner already received 25 million. They're now going to get a check for an additional $20 million. It's called selling your company twice. And that's the benefit from do it, for doing any type of owner financing. Now let's move over to your leadership or your family members. There's five of them. And there's 10 million in that bucket because there was 30 million total. Each family member, in addition to working for the company, still making an income from the company, is going to be handed a check for $2 million. Now that original shareholder family member may take that additional 20 in their bucket and may put it all in the family bucket. They may feel like the original 25 million that they received was ample payment. They may put that entire 30 million into that bucket. That means those five family members would have gotten $6 million a piece. Hmm. And that's, okay. that's two to five years after the ESOP is formed. So that's the second bite of the apple benefit. Now, let me tell you how the company can grow exponentially to afford buying four other portfolio companies. 
Okay. So when you form an ESOP, you become a tax free entity. You no longer pay corporate taxes. Hmm. So yet today, you're paying 33 to 40% corporate taxes. Tomorrow, all that money goes to the bottom line on your balance sheet hmm. and can be used to exponentially grow your company, to attract talent, to and you know, to expand in your marketplace. And during that second bite of the apple, it's key to use during that time period, it's key to use those additional resources to grow your company so that you can maximize that for your family members, for yourself, et cetera, or if it's not a family business for employees that are now employee shareholders. And now you can see why with not paying corporate taxes anymore, you can see how the retirement benefit fund That's huge, huge grow. benefit. Expe- I know, um, I so, know people from grocery stores that are baggers that have one, two, and three million dollars in their retirement fund just from being an ESOP. Amazing. So, who is a good candidate for an ESOP? What type of company? What size? What type? What industries? Just can you give us a? It's any industry, any type of company, but you have to have. 15 full-time employees or more. And when I say full-time, mm-hmm. they have to be W-2 working a thousand hours a year or more each. Okay. In addition, you have to have a minimum of a million dollars in profit for not, not your gross, your net profit um, for us to do a feasibility study. That's, that's okay. on the low end. Okay. But we we want to help businesses that are small businesses as well do this. So we don't cap it off at 20 million or or more. We cap. want to help everybody we possibly can. So what do you mean cap it off at 20 million? You're talking about revenues of 20 million? Yes. Okay. Yep. So so any business has got 15 or more full-time equivalent employees yes. and, and is got a million dollars net profit is a good candidate. Um yes. And so, um, and obviously, if you capping it at, if you don't cap it at twenty million, you're saying there's plenty of companies that are even larger, maybe a hundred million or more. Oh yes, yep. Okay, and With minimum cap would be twenty. There's some companies out there that that will not uh, do ESOPs for companies that are under twenty. What I was saying is, we want to help yes. the small business Understood. owner. That's so un- right. We do it with companies that are less. Okay. Do they have to have a strong management team in place or um, do they have to have employees who have any money? Um, no, zero money for the employees because it doesn't cost them anything. Okay. Um, they're allocated shares over time. Okay. There's a vesting period and, and that is determined by the original shareholders, how long right. If they don't want, we've got a client right now that's going through the process with us that didn't want any vesting period whatsoever. And what we do is we make recommendations based on the um, financial health of the company. Okay, so let me let me run let me run an example by so listeners can understand and so I can understand. So let's say you have a company that has a fair market value of ten million dollars. Okay. And uh, let's say it's making a million dollars net profit um, at the end of every year. The owner exits. Um, there's a single owner, let's just assume. Does that single owner, if, if the owner continues to work in the business, the owner can continue to draw a salary? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, 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 and stay in control of their company if they want. Of course. Okay. And now of the million dollars in net profit, um, I mean, if they p- paid all of that out and if it made a million every single year, it would take a minimum of 10 years to pay that owner out. Um, do they use all the net profits to pay the, you know, to pay the owner? Do they only use a portion of it? No, it's it's set up um, with a bank loan and then with owner financing. 
And with the company, now remember, this company that's a million in profit is now going to be larger than that because they're not paying corporate taxes anymore. Okay, that's a good okay. point. And, so, and, and the owner's gotten maybe 50% of the $10 million purchase price right. up front, and he's that's carrying correct. back 50%. Um, and so now, really, he's only owed $5 million plus interest. And right. so you're saying that the million dollars might be closer to a million and a half uh, without or, or, well, it's a million dollars. So that million dollars in net profit, I was assuming was pre-tax. Um, okay. So, so, but. Um, and well, like I said, we'd have to look at that in a feasibility study to see if that would be doable if they were at a million net profit. Okay. We, there's too many vari variables. Um, in each situation. Uh, and I honestly haven't worked on an ESOP that we didn't make happen. Um, but I can't say we, that we had one that was as far down as a million. I do know we go that low. Okay. But, I but so one, one, one of my conceptions is that ESOPs are only good if an owner has a, a willingness to take a long payout period. Um, so in other words, five, 10, maybe even 20 years. Is that two, true? Two to five years is is normal. Interesting, okay. So it's, it's just two to five years. It's not uh, longer than that, unless you reload for the second bite of the apple. Okay. Um, so you've already got your purchase price from the original purchase price. And as far as I'm concerned, the second bite of the apple, that's a bonus. Right. So what is, I understand what's meant by a second bite of the apple, but so other people can understand uh, you're selling it for, they, he sells it for $10 million this time around, but he retains equity and hopes that it grows so that it's worth 15 or 20 or whatever million dollars at a, at a later time. And then they are selling uh, another balance of their stock at that time. Is it? Is there actually a transaction at the second bite of the apple, or is it? There is there, okay. and it and it's actually typically as much as you sold it for the first time or more. Mm, okay. So in the example I gave you, because it was worth a hundred million, they sold it for thirty. They sold it for twenty-five the first time, thirty the second time. Now they divided that between themselves and the management team. And you can do that. You can, or you can put it all in the management team's bucket if it's your family members and you're transitioning to your family. It's totally up to the original shareholder. They customize that management incentive plan. Okay. So when should owners consider exiting through an ESOP? Actually, um, we see owners at about 55 years old, but the sooner, the better. Once you get to a dollar amount that you're satisfied with transitioning your company, because the longer your company is an ESOP and you're involved, the better. And the more growth, it's been, it's been a proven fact that uh, you can grow exponentially as an ESOP versus as a traditional company just with just with being a tax-free entity in itself. But in addition to that, okay, um, another benefit that I didn't mention is that the business owner can elect a 1042 exchange. And so they can defer their capital gains indefinitely through that 1042 exchange. And then right now, currently, when the heirs take it out after their passing, they um, have a step up in basis, so they don't have to pay the capital gains either. Interesting. Wow, that's a nuance. So I was involved with an ESOP. It was a $8 million a year um, automotive aftermarket accessory company. I don't know what their net profits were, um, but I think one of the disadvantages, it seemed, was that the owner had, had set up the ESOP mm -hmm. Um, probably at age 70, maybe it was at age 65. And here he was at age 80, still working in the business, 
still making decisions, still running uh, the day to day when uh, the person who I was coaching wanted to be basically in that leadership role, making those decisions. So it was an interesting situation. And is that common for an owner selling to stick around and stay involved for so many years like that? They can. If they if they want to, the owner can stay on and stay in control of their company. But I can tell you that there's six partners at the company that I had, and four of us are on the board. None of us are working in the business anymore. Mm-hmm. We're just overseeing because we did some portion of owner financing plus the second bite of the apple. So we want to see that through. We have, you know, a financial investment there. So we are on the board, um, but that's a much lesser role. And I do advise that uh, for a business owner because yes. you still have voting rights then. Sure, sure. So you have, you know, uh, fiduciary control mm-hmm. of the company without being in the weeds in the day-to-day. Makes sense. All right. So actually you, you alluded to, so I want to ask, how do you put an ESOP in place? You alluded to, the first stage step is a feasibility study. Tell us a little That's bit right. more about that. And then um, what's next after you decide it's feasible. So first is the feasibility study and the high level valuation. That is not an official valuation because if you choose not to do the ESOP, we do not want to hurt your valuation by having um, this valuation on the books. If it's lower than which typically it isn't, but if it's lower than what somebody offered you, like in our situation, we had 30% over fair market value. You don't want a valuation out there to hurt you, right? Right. So we don't do anything um, on paper, but then we put a feasibility study together that shows you exactly how your company is going to function as an ESOP and now a tax-free entity over the next 10 years. That's part of phase one. Phase two is the debt raise. That's when we go out to the banks and we actually raise the finances according to the uh, valuation study that we did. Okay. Okay. After that, we get the trustee involved. The trustee represents the employees and we represent the shareholders. The trustee brings in their own valuation company that does a much deeper dive. And this is an official valuation. I can tell you that the original valuation we had done that was high level on our company came back less than what the trustee after doing a deeper dive, he felt, and he was working on behalf of the employees, he felt that the company was worth more than the original valuation. So that was very, very pleasing to all the owners, if you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And because we were pleased with the first valuation. The second valuation, um, when when he came back with that, like I said, we were very pleased with that. Um, and then after that, that's we go move into the closing phase, which is phase three. And all the uh, documentation is done. The legal team puts the entire ESOP together. The company literally, other than providing uh, a data room so that the trustee can review all the financials, et cetera, it's almost seamless for the company because it's a... a Interesting. Now, is this... Is a new entity formed by the legal team? I mean, is this has yes. this moved from a C or an S corp or even a sole yes. proprietorship to some new type of ent- what is that entity? So, best case scenario. So, if you're an LLC, whatever whatever um, corporate structure you are, mm-hmm. if you want to take advantage of the 1042 exchange, you need to be a C corp right now with the current tax laws. Okay. okay? So let's talk about what a 1042 exchange is, is that there are, that's one option. You don't have to do a 1042 exchange if you want to do it. You don't have to, if you want to pay, 
If you want to pay capital gains tax, you don't have to do that. I see. But so this, if this... you do that, our legal team changes that corporate structure for you. Okay. You don't even have to be involved in that. You don't have to do any heavy lifting. We do it all. And then at, once that is in place, then we switch you over to an S Corp because it's the S Corp where you become a tax free entity. And the reason why is because an S Corp, there's a flow through. And when you flow through to a company that's an ESOP, an ESOP is a tax exempt entity. That's how the corporation becomes tax free. But wait, you said so, you said you set up a I think you lost me on that. You set up a C Corp and then you transition it to an S Corp. So that's let's correct. assume it's an S Corp to begin with. You're transitioning it to a C Corp. And then back. And and that's so that they can have different classes of stock, as I imagine. That's correct. And then so they can take the, advantage of the 1042 exchange and then take advantage of the tax exempt entity. And then the IRS allows you to change it back yet again to yes, they a, do. an S Corp. Yes, they do. Interesting. And this doesn't this can all be done in a year or less, or is this a multi-year type of an activity? 45 to 60 days. That's amazing because it common wisdom tells us that you can't change and elect to change your corporation status um more than you know. I, it, well, you can't change it that often. I know. I don't know how often it is. You you can. Um, our legal team knows the ins and outs of how mm. that can be done. Interesting. And okay. how to work through that process. And uh, they do it day in and day out. Okay. All right. So now you've got the, you've done all this work. You've set up so that you're eligible for the capital gains tax benefit, which is a huge benefit. And I thought that was one of the main reasons um, to set up an ESOP. I don't know if you would agree or not, or if that's well, a mis- that and the tax-free entity, both of them are tremendous. Yep. Plus the second bite of the apple, the uh, retirement benefit windfall for your staff, the management incentive program. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have multiple shareholders, you can customize uh, the ESOP transaction per shareholder. Mm-hmm. So it's very flexible that way. It's not a one size fit all, fits all. Right. Right. If I wanted to sell 100% of my stock to the ESOP and my partner only wanted to sell 30, we could do that. So there's a lot of flexibility, which you don't see in other transactions. Plus, uh, there's a trustee appointed that oversees the ESOP, okay? Mm-hmm. And they don't get involved in the day-to-day operations. So your company's operations, there is not one missed beat. It does not change whatsoever. Now, if the owner wants to step down, you had asked earlier about a um, leadership team. Yes. If the owner wants to step down, there needs to be a leadership team in place because the tr- that is something that the trustee is going to want to know. Can a leadership team be a single individual? Or is absolutely. It to be- okay. It can be, it can be the uh, president and CEO of the company. Now, absolutely. Let, let, and let me ask you, so let's, this, let's take an example of a smaller company. It's, it's got uh, $4 million in annual revenues. Um, it generates, uh, let's say, $500,000. Uh, net profit a year. And let's say it's got a value of uh, four times its uh, free cash flow. So it's got a $2 million valuation. Um, Can you, I know it's not the minimum of a million dollar net worth. Can you set up an ESOP with a company like this? We'd have to do a feasibility study to do a deeper dive before I could answer that. Okay, but it's possible? Um, we typically don't do any under a million profit. That is, that is the threshold I've been given uh, by my uh, investment banker and legal team. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. But so it's it, so we don't know the answer whether it's possible or not. We just know that it's not something you do. I understand. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know of anyone else in the company that or in the country 
that even does them for companies as small as we do. Okay. So I know that um, there are others out there that don't take any clients under 20 million. Interesting. Okay. So now once you've got the ESOP in place, how does it work? What, what is need, what happens on a regular basis? You said the trustee needs to have like an office or a data room or something. Did I understand that? (coughs) No, excuse me. What they need every year. The only thing that is required is now the management of the retirement fund, but it's just like a 401k. So that can either be managed internally or you can, um, you know, contract that out. We're, we're personally managing ours internally. The one thing that the trustee, the trustee really doesn't get involved in the day-to-day, but what they do need every year is they need a valuation. The company has to have a valuation done on an annual basis, and that has to be reported to the trustee. That is the only requirement Interesting. Is that annual valuation. Okay. So now what happens? It, so do they typically use the same, eval, um, and I assume it's got to be a certified appraiser who's the valuation firm? The or? valuation company, yes. It has to be a third party okay. certified. Yep. Okay. But interestingly enough, if um, after you go through the transaction and we've appointed a trustee, you have every legal right to change that trustee to yourself. Okay. Wow. So I'm the owner so, and seller of the business. Yep. I can make I can become the trustee and uh, <coughs> but I, and, and I use a third party uh, evaluation or valuation firm to uh, to come up with the value. Now what happens if the business is in a declining state? Maybe it's in a declining industry. And uh, yeah. Um, so in a business that's in a declining state or a declining industry, um, is this a difficult situation or impossible situation to be able to sell the business and you know to, or to carry on with the ESOP? Well, it's very interesting that you should ask that because... When we were doing our ESOP, there was a little thing called COVID. Yes. Well. And our ESOP actually got put on pause because it was supposed to close on April 1st, 2020. And I think everybody remembers what was going on then. We were shut down pretty much as a, com- as a country. And no one really knew what to expect. Right. So the trustee put the transaction on pause until we as a company could prove that we were going to survive this pandemic. Right. And, and we had to prove that through financials uh, for April and May. And then on June 5th, he allowed us to close our transaction. Well, that, that's not surprising that you went through that. I mean, I had difficulty selling real estate during the, that same period of time. But I'm concerned about someone who's already been in an ESOP and they're maybe been in it uh, for a year or two, or maybe they're a machine shop and they have declining interest in their business. <coughs> the inter- industry is in a downturn. Um, how it's, does the, yeah. How does the it's ESOP? No, it's no different than any other company in a downturn economy, with the exception, it's a proven fact, there's statistics out there that any downturn economic times, including COVID, ESOPs have fared better. better. And the reason being is you've got a group of employee owners banding together, coming up with creative solutions, how to survive. Right. Instead of a traditional corporate structure with employees. Right. And ESOPs actually lay off fewer people during downturn economies as well. Interesting. Well, I think um, many people are familiar with the Springfield Remanufacturing Company and the story that uh, of Jack Stack and uh, the, I believe it was a John Deere company. Um, um, 
So yeah, very interesting story there became the great game of business. And we know that employees who stay close together, really, um, uh, they'll come up with more creative solutions for how to save a business. Right. And that's, that's very true. And there's, like I said, statistics out there to show that with ESOP. Yep. Very interesting. All right. So Patty Plu, the ESOP evangelist, your company is uh, once again, the name Excel Legacy. Excel Legacy Group. Okay. And we'll have your contact information in the show notes. And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge about ESOPs. Uh, I think this is a topic that I'm going to dive deeper into with other guests because I think this is a tremendous opportunity for clients uh, and companies that are small, medium sized businesses as a way to exit their business. So thanks for being on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So yeah, another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. This one's on ESOPs. If you liked this show, please share it. If you have suggestions for other guests, um, please contact me. Um, Thank you very much. Jonathan Goldhill over and out. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, Please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.